everything is going to hell down here in Texas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. It is I. It is me. It is the big bad B.O.B. Here with you today for another installment of your favorite assassination-related podcast, The Lone Gunman Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Mr. Rob Clark, as always. Welcome to the show, folks. I digress from my humble beginnings here. Um, today we're going to be talking about some of the, uh, interpen people again. Uh, today we're going to be looking more at Roy Hargraves and some of the people that he was associated with back in the day. And we're going to see what we can glean from these, uh, relationships so let's do it before we do let me highlight you I always tell you at the end of the show so let me start at the beginning of the show if you have not already I beg of you please go to YouTube search for the Lone Gunman podcast channel subscribe and like and comment trying to get to a thousand here and I would appreciate it muchly if you would help a brother out. Uh, also, you can follow along at the Lone Gunman 7 on Twitter. And the Facebook page is the Lone Gunman Facebook. Or the Lone Gunman Podcast. Sorry. On Facebook. I'm trying to get away from Facebook, though. It's kind of a pain in the ass. But uh, who was Roy Hargraves? Well, I can't. He was a bad man. He was a notorious uh, overt ops operator, anti-Castro uh, fighter, and friend and confidant to many of the people that we like to refer to on the show when it comes to suspects. Many people believe that Roy Hargraves and Philippe Vidal Santiago were the umbrella man and the walkie talkie man or dark, dark complected man in Dealey Plaza that day in Dallas, November 22nd, 1963. And to start things off here, um, and it's been a while since we brought this up on the show, so I'm going to just refresh your memories a little bit um, with the. Noel Twyman interview of uh, Roy Hargraves and Robert Hemming uh, for his book, Bloody Treason, which uh, was published back in the mid 90s. And that uh, I believe the full transcript was not in his book, but was later published as a supplement to Larry Hancock's fine book called Someone Would Have Talked. And it's a very appropriate addition to uh, Larry Hancock's book, Someone Would Have Talked, because it's full of people that did talk. And in this interview, R. Graves does a lot of talking. And we're going to hit some of the highlights of this stuff. And uh, we're also going to get into a man by the name of Mitch Warbell. But, uh, 
we'll dive into him more here in a little bit. Um, so from the interview by Noel Twyman, and I'll just hit some of the highlights here. Um, he said, uh, they're talking about people who was in the no name key group for a while. Um, Hargrave says this from Martino's house, you know, money coming through, you know, what source who gives a fuck. You didn't ask Twyman ass. No, we got a job to do. The money helps get it done. Where's the money? Okay. I don't care what strings are on the money. That has nothing to do with it. That's not my end of things. So we have basically here Hargraves corroborating what Lauren Hall states that there was money coming from Sam Giancana, Santo Traficante, to these anti Castro freedom fighters via John Martino. Uh, Twyman asked one of those meetings in Martino's house. Anthony Summers wrote about it later, where he had interviewed Martino's wife and she had. And she had told about how when on November 22nd, she and her husband were going out to lunch. And when they came back, it was on TV that Kennedy had been killed and he turned white. And he had told her that morning, Flo, they are going to kill Kennedy when he gets to Dallas. And there they had come back and it happened and got on the phone and he was talking on the phone for hours. And she told Summers, but he told her, you know, we had that meeting, a good-looking kid you know, sitting on the couch that was involved in it, and I asked Jerry who it was. Hargrave says, not nice, not nice, that is not nice, that is not nice at all. Chuckling a little as he says it, he gets up and leaves the room. Quiman says, what's in my book? And Hargrave says, well, I haven't seen it, I'm sorry, no disrespect intended, but your book is boring as hell. I just get bogged down in it. I tried to wade through a chapter that I knew absolutely nothing about. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's so esoteric. And then I'll go back to something I do know about for a change of pace, and it's so depressing. I go back and try to do it again. Kleiman says, well, people who have read my book have told me how good it is time and again. And Hargrave says, well, they're just being nice. <laughs> Kleiman says, the book will blow your mind if you read it. And Hargrave says, well, how come no one got Martino's telephone records? The records of his telephone calls for that book. Surely, don't you think that's one of the things that might have interested the FBI? No, you know, like we've brought up other times. Why didn't the FBI do this and why didn't they do that? Why wasn't I busted at a particular time? Nope. How come I got out of jail free? What, do I owe you guys something or do you owe me? Twyman says the FBI covered up every possible thing they could in this whole story. The only thing they didn't cover up were documents that got out that were printed in the newspaper when they couldn't be covered up. And then they debunked it. If they couldn't cover it up, then they debunked it. Robert Hemming, not Jerry now. This is Robert Hemming, Jerry's brother, is in this meeting. He says, I don't mean to be telling you your business, but instead of coming out with a second edition or your book, you ought to come out with a sequel, and you ought to concentrate on this, the Cuban connection, period, and develop it. The autopsy shit, that's all history. But you have performed a valuable service by taking a person that's totally naive about the JFK thing, and you've given them a handbook to go inquire. So you don't need to come out with a second edition. A sequel is the way to go, man. Hargrave says, everybody else has got their expert, you know, Groden, a bullet, and so, and so, this, and so, and so that, that have covered one aspect or another, and everybody's got their pet theories on it and everything, like Oliver Stone as to what happened. So they think I want everything I can that fits the scenario. If it doesn't fit the scenario, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be exposed to it. Your book scatter guns so damn effectively, I'm certain, but in so many different directions. Where in the hell do you go from here, and how can you possibly keep track of this? Excuse me. Twyman says, I tried to summarize it at the end. And then he said, well, you did a really good job with what you did. But your book is a can of worms. 
Hargrave says, here's a thought. It certainly kept Jerry alive. Jerry has spun so many bullshit stories out there, you know, with the truth. You know, he's not credible. Now, if I tell somebody something is true, everybody's going to say, no, that's from Jerry. And they're referring to Jerry Hemming here, of course, who's famous for his stories. Clyman said, I've been accused of that for including Jerry's stuff in my book. One person and I got into violent arguments about this. He said, keep Hemming stuff out of your book. It's going to ruin your book. And I just finally told him I'm going to put it in. Hargrave says, hey, I talked to Jerry on the phone about what's the latest story you laid on Weberman. And he said, I don't know. It's something nasty about you. Let me see if I can remember it. And he'd come up with some off-the-wall story that he laid on Weberman. He said, how's that one? I said, hey, that's pretty good, man. That's better than the last one. But it was self-defense. Twyman says, I have a second edition of the book ready to go, but without any of this new stuff in it, so I could still do a second edition, and then, and I could write a new book. Heaven forbid my marriage wouldn't stand it. Hargrave says, our southern friends say, Tan diot e piquanto de la suerte. Twyman says, what's that mean? Hargrave says, with God and a little bit of luck. Now, you got another book in you, do you think? And Twyman says, well, I'm getting pretty old. I'm 75. And Hemming says, well, that's when your mind really starts working. Twyman says, well, I suppose, but I've been trying to stop this. Hargrave says, you're 75, but you're a lot prettier than I am. Laughs. Hargrave's, um, he's talking about an, an element of, uh, Intelligence agencies, he says, everybody thinks that because a few people in powerful positions in an organization are dirty, that means the whole organization is dirty, which is false. There's a few FBI people that have been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. God knows J. Edgar would not put anybody in on this thing that he couldn't trust absolutely to hold their mud and keep their mouth shut, whatever happened. And I'm sure the same... It is, I'm sure it's the same on the spook end of things, whether it was DEA, CIA, NSA, whoever else had their hand in the cookie jar, whoever they had there was either rogue or deniable that if it, that it could not be linked back directly to them, just like Wilson and Turkle on their shit, they were rogue. So moving on down through here. Huh. Wyman asks, uh, you remember the Robert Kennedy assassination? Hargrave says, yes, we, and Twyman cuts him off. The fact that this LAPD being in their intelligence, FBI and CIA being in LAPD intelligence is what I'm referring to. Hargrave says, three of us from the JFK thing were there on the ground at the time. <laughs> Fat Larry, Lawrence Howard, Jerry and I. Yeah, we were here. And I pulled the operation. I don't even know. I don't even know Larry is out here. I knew he was up in California. Didn't know he was on the ground at the time. Larry? Hargraves, yeah. Larry Howard. Fat Larry. In fact, I understand his op was, uh, you might talk to him if you ever do an interview with him. Heming says, yeah, he won't talk. Hargraves says, about his brown beret. Heming says, well, he might talk about that. Hargrave says he might talk about the Brown Berets, yeah. And Hemming says he won't talk about any of the other stuff because I've talked to him about it. Whatever he'll talk about with me, he'll talk about with you. He'll talk you uh, up to a point, and then he'll talk to you about after that time. But there's a window of time from June 63 until such and such in 64 that he will not talk about. Because whoever he was connected to was too, too sensitive. Like some of Roy's time, it's just way too sensitive. And Hargrave says, but the thing is, while he's being inserted into the Brown Beret thing, doing that from that radical end of it, I'm hitting from an altogether different direction and really scaring the ant's nest up. You know, running guns through him, trading guns for drugs, trading back for more guns. 
And Twyman asks, and this bracketed the Bobby Kennedy assassination? And Hargrave says, yes. Twyman says, same time? Hargrave says, yes. And then Twyman uh, says, well, we didn't get finished with the John Martino story. The good-looking guy on the couch. And I said that his wife said that the good-looking young kid sitting on the sofa was involved in it. And you said, that's not nice. And then the tape ran out. But I asked Jerry, who do you think that good-looking Carrie or the good-looking kid was? And he hesitated, and then he said, Ponce de Leon. Hargraves chuckles. Ponce was about as trustworthy as a snake. It sure as hell wouldn't have been introduced to a top-level connection like Martino. You couldn't be certain of Ponce's loyalties because his mother was still in a Castro prison. And he kept getting into fights with a Canadian who was with us, one of the good guys, Bill Dempsey, and snitched him off to the feds to get sent back to Canada. One of the things I taught was knife fighting, hand-to-hand combat, and I've never in my life met anyone with reflexes like Ponce's. He was so fast. He was so incredibly fast. Imagine those freak reflexes that nuts like Billy the Kid and people like that must have had. Hemming tells a story about Ponce with a gun in his hand. Can't understand the mumbling in most of it. Hargrave says, again, here, Jerry's talking about November. Philippe and I in Dallas. Jerry names Bob Johnson. And a reference here, you know, ask Colby. Seriously, like I told you, I, or he gave you at the end not a, a real name. Man, if you could get a hold of Johnson's papers, you might get some shit there that nobody ever even brought to cover, thought to cover up. But Johnson, being the faggot that he was to begin with, he loved insurance. Insurance like insurance policies, Twyman asked? No, no. I mean, like, perhaps he had the conversation taped where you hired him to go and do this, and he fails to inform you. Um, and Twyman says, this is the guy Jerry Fields was involved in the Martin Luther King assassination. Robert E. Johnson, right? Yes, Robert Evan Johnson, Hargreaves says. Interesting. Robert Hemming goes on to say, Lauren Hall and Ed somebody, yes, they're being controlled by Castro agents and they're being sent to burn a source of money. There he goes in the front door of Lester Lowe's place and goes out the back door and a fucking FBI agent shows up with Lauren Hall, all right. You're booked, Mr. Lowe. Why? Did you see you just left? Oh. If you promise not to talk to him anymore, we won't be auditing your books. Okay. Gary said for years and years he told this story going out the back door and you see Feds going out the front door right after him, burning his sources. Kleiman says, so Lauren Hall was a Fed or he was a Castro agent? Hemming says, he wouldn't know that he was working for Fidel. Uh... Bernie de Torres been working for years for Fidel and didn't know it. He does now. After a while, if you sit down and start thinking about some of the jobs you've done, you start realizing who you've been working for. If everybody you killed was an anti caster agent or had something to do with it, you'll figure it out after a while. Hargrave says, A lot of these things I made notation on are hit with a marker pen if you review any of this. So, interesting. Twyman says, we were trying to figure out coming up here just when Oswald got co-opted into being a patsy. At what point? And I was saying, you know, in fact, if you're talking about Roy and Vidal, Roy could have been in Dallas, been involved in the Walker incident, been involved with Oswald, been involved in even getting him the rifle. Not that you were, but you could have. And it could be innocent. That doesn't mean you're involved in the Kennedy assassination. And Hargrave says, well, how come one of the worst pieces of shit weapons going, the man liquor Carcano, how come so many of them are turning up at the same time? How come they're bought by this one agent in New Orleans? What, four of them? That's also in your papers. He gets four of them. How come a couple more of them turn up? You know, it's all of a sudden out of nowhere, the chief weapon of choice. A halfway decent weapon set up. Uh... It was very cheap to get a hold of. If you needed to do some troops on a budget thing, why go for the Carcano? 
That's the only time I've ever heard of that fucking piece of shit rifle. And Hemming said, yeah, there was you couldn't find any ammo for the gun. No ammo, no ammo. Hargrave says, yes, yes. Um, Twyman says, yeah, it's always been a mystery. Why a $3 rifle? And Hargrave says, yeah, for a million dollar tag. Twyman says, well, Jerry handed me a document that he used to work for Klein Sporting Goods, and when they captured Oswald, they find that he got his rifle from Klein's sporting goods. And Robert Henning said, that's what we call a setup. Kleiman says, yeah, there's a little connection there. Um, Robert Henning says, you have to talk to some, some, to some ex-Marines. They used the M1 Durand. They didn't use the bolt rifle. The only people who used the bolt rifle in the Marine Corps were snipers. And they hadn't been officially formed yet. Rifle wasn't a scout sniper. So he would not use a bolt rifle. He would use an M1. And M1s were hard to come by back then. You could get M1 carbines. They were around. But the actual M1 rifle was still being used on active duty. So they weren't showing up in surplus. So if you gave this guy the Marine Corps weapon of choice. That was a signature. What's Oswald doing with an official weapon? Um, they talk about uh, burning Oswald through the jury and the Fair Play for Cuba committee. And Hemming says, that's the point. It may have been a Oswald. It wasn't the Oswald. They totally missed the point. Interesting. And Noel Twyman said, there's a CIA document out of Mexico City from Winscott that Fabian Escalante was in Dallas on November the 22nd. Fabian Escalante in Dallas. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, what the hell? I don't know. Deming says, this is Fabian Escalante, the same guy who shows up in Nassau talking to you guys, saying Philippe uh, did all this shit. Yeah, if he's pulling his toenails out, sure, or drowning him in a bucket of water or whatever. Torturing them for information. Let's get down to the good stuff here. Um, they're talking about uh, what's going to happen when the real story on Hargraves comes out. It's going to be a shit show. Uh, Weberman's, is, Weberman's another psycho, but did I ever ask him about Dealey Plaza or Philippe? No. And he didn't. Kleiman says, really? He didn't, Hargrave said. In fact, when he approached me on the subject, he said, I don't know how to tell you this, Hargraves, but some information surfaced that does put Felipe in Dallas on the 18th of November. And I said, oh, shit. I'm sure it's been said many times. And so the guy, Shodel, says, you were the only two guys on the airplane? Referring to the flight to Dallas. And Hargrave says, no, there were two other people, but both of them are still living. And yourself, yes. And Philippe, Felipe, yes. Hargrave says, yes, and a pilot. Shuttle says, and a pilot. Oh. So they were part of a team headed to Dallas. Do something. Nasty on November the 22nd, 1963. But apparently they weren't informed what it was. They were just told what to do and they did it. And they asked him about Bishop. They're showing him pictures of all these people. And uh, this guy that went by the name of Bishop, Hargraves identifies him as Adrian O'Hare. Interesting. I want to clarify the date on this hair thing. You say it was in the 70s, but anyway, it was Bishop who said that he was in Dallas on November 22nd and he was at the trademark. He was over there doing security work at the trademark. Now, also, FBI documents have O'Hare taking a trip to Dallas in 1963 on November 22nd. I've got to nail down that document. This was all an effort to try to find out if O'Hare was actually this Colonel Bishop that you know. But anyway, you know that's Colonel Bishop. And it's quite sure John Adrian O'Hare. 
He's the guy who can shoot a bird with a rifle 500 yards away, Clement says. Hargrave says, oh, he can, laughing. That's what he claimed he could do. Hargrave says, yes, Jerry claims he can too, laughing. So Shodel says, let me make a point here. Roy is saying that that picture of that guy as Bishop is still alive. Is that what you said? Hargrave says, I didn't say he's alive. I don't know if he's alive or not. He said, I just said I knew him and who I knew him as. And as far as being a, well, directions at least came through him. Green light, green light. Hargrave says, I find it hard to believe that they originated with him. I don't think he was at that level of authority. He performed the same function as us, like out here that Jerry performed with me, you know, on the California Ops. It was like a base officer. Interesting. So, possible scenarios. Twyman says, let's look at this scenario. Somebody calls Bishop and says, I want you to bring Felipe, Vidal, and Hargraves into Dallas on November 22nd and have them meet with so-and-so. Hargraves, well, it wouldn't have been worded like that anyway. It would have been, I want you to bring a team. Uh, Hemming says, so he'd know who they are talking about. It would be his team. Hargraves says, yeah, he would know. So he may have been unwittingly instrumental in setting you guys up, Twyman says. Yes, Hargrave says. He'd be running a section of an op, and he wouldn't know anything beyond what he needed to know for his section, because he's on the count like the rest of us. Twyman says, so he could have gotten that message from anybody, like a Bill Harvey or Morales. And Hargrave says, yes, it would have been the next step over him anyway of his control. So, interesting. Hargrave says, how many of us were there that knew each other from Miami but weren't aware that each other was in town? That could have been used for any one of alternate scenarios, either individually or in groups. For whatever purpose, like I said before, if somebody screwed up, if there was a last-minute change made in the parade route, if one of the key shooters was compromised by some $3-an-hour security guard, the Dealey Plaza thing is dead, so what happens? You know, if the bomb goes. If the bomb goes, Who's set to be the Oswald for the bomb? If it's got to be at the hospital or at the airport or at the trademark or whatever the scenario is, who is on top would be captured dead. Kwame asks hard things. How did you learn to make bombs? Did you go to a bomb school or learn from somebody else? Hargrave says, no, I learned from a master. Who's that? Hargrave said, again, I learned from a master. Yes, I was well taught by somebody that learned very, very hard and how to do it, and then did it. But unfortunately, she was a terrorist. I was a freedom fighter. She was a terrorist who wanted to be a freedom fighter. I have no idea where she is. She'd probably been long dead, but she knew more about the nitty-gritty and down to it than any so-called male expert I've seen since. The male guys that have the knowledge, you know, like the Colbys, weren't the type who would go out and use things for those purposes. He wouldn't use that outside. So, Hargrave said he learned everything he knows about making bombs from a woman. Interesting. So then there, uh, Twyman says, you say that you were speculating, that is, Felipe, the walkie-talkie man, are you speculating or do you... Hargrave says, that's not for me to say. Quam says, well, if this is Felipe, then he was hardly innocent when he was there. If he was doing something like this, he hardly was just there being set up, right? Hargrave says, he was doing a part of something. He didn't know what it was. Hemming says, he was told to be there and do that. Hargrave says he went ahead and did his job because by that time you were either doing your job when you see what it actually is, your old shit moment because you don't know who's behind ready to whack you out. You don't know who's behind that fence with Secret Service ID. He's laughs. Uh, Shodel says, here's a pretty good picture that introduces Black Dog Man. Who's this guy? Hargrave says, this guy you put with the underpass people. All he's doing is getting a signal from this side. Now, this is the way I would read it. He's getting a signal from this side, you know. We're live. We made it through. It's still green. So this way, he would simply take a couple of steps and make a signal, and it would happen on the other side. 
Um, so yeah, interesting. He says, but who is giving the guys behind the picket fence? Well, Margrave says he'll get his signal. He can get his signal by one of the observers or the umbrella man, who he might have been, or somebody that we haven't pointed out yet. It's just, it gets crazier and crazier, folks. You can't make this shit up. Um, and then they're talking about. Um, trajectories and he says Hargraves says he, apparently Hargraves was along with Jerry Hemming a consultant on the Oliver Stone film JFK and he says Jerry was the one that really pushed Oliver Stone on this to try to get him to look at this corner of the book depository and he wouldn't do it Shodell says he wouldn't do it Hargraves says no um, let's see that's basically it from the Roy Hargraves interview. So if you'd like to read it in full, I would suggest go finding that edition of Someone What a Talk by Larry Hancock. It's uh, very interesting, but that's just some of the highlights. And apparently it seems that uh, Roy Hargraves is placing himself and Vidal, Felipe Vidal, and Hemming in Dallas along with somebody else. Uh, their crew on November the 22nd, 1963. So very interesting stuff. And then we have this from November 14th, 1990. Dear Dave, I'm assuming it's Dave Perry. We have a correspondence from Harold Weisberg. He says, I'm sorry you, Jerry, with a G and Jerry with a J, who has a bad knee, could not have been here yesterday to enjoy my two surprise visitors. Two now middle-aged anti-Castroites who figure in the official investigations of the JFK assassination. One Jerry Patrick Hemming and one Roy Hargraves. Hemming phoned from the AARC offices in D.C. yesterday morning to ask if they could come. And I asked him to use pencil and paper and write the directions down. And believe it or not, he did. He got off the expressway at the correct exit and then got lost, making only the two turns required to get here. Uh, driving is not inexpensive and a new van. It seems they are working for Bud Finsterwald in his assassination archives and research center on the Ricky White concoction that his father Roscoe was one of JFK's assassins. Trying as they correctly understand Bud's attitude to prove that this fairy tale is or cannot be true, after all that has come to light and all that I've told Bud that proves it isn't and can't be true. They understand that Bud is a true believer, that Jim Lee Lazar tends to agree with him and feel as he does, that Kevin Walsh is troubled by and what they can't identify, and Mark Allen is op openly skeptical. It was not easy to present to them the disproofs that I have because Hemming wanted to recall his past and the people he met and what he uh, was doing and tended to monopolize our time. But Hargraves did make some notes. I gave them the, two, the items of disproof of the details of this concoction and the titles of the books that were plagiarized. They had seen a copy of the novel Promises to Keep at the AARC offices and had a copy of Hopkins with them, the second Oswald. Hemming seems not to have aged as much as I've expected from the kind of life he leads, but his six foot six body now bulges at the belly more than mine does, and Hargrave puffs out a bit there as well. I last saw Hemming 22 years ago, and I've never seen Hargraves before. He surprised me, however, by quoting the Robert Frost poem from which the novel gets its title, Promises to Keep. Hemming, who has detested Hall for years, Lauren Hall, that is, confirmed that one of my Baltimore police friends who'd been here earlier in the day and flew to lunch with his girlfriend told me that Hall and his son had been arrested in Oklahoma for selling some kind of dope pills to raise money for the Contras and were in jail for it. Um, not that any of their past is relevant to the JFK assassination, although it did figure in the investigations with regard to the one real length of the men who appeared at Sylvia Odio's apartment in Dallas just before the assassination with one presented to her as Leon Oswald, who said JFK should be killed and he would show them how. Both disagree with the account that one was Hall. They seem to have had some kind of connection with the 
Christie Institute and that suit against the CIA over the bombing that was to have killed Eden Pastor for the Contras and instead wounded the correspondent, uh, Tony somebody and others. They claim that in Hemming's word, which is not easy to accept without confirmation, that they are 99% sure that the man they think was at Odios is the man who was responsible for that bombing. Interesting. He says, Hargrave surprised me not only because he quoted Frost, but because of his interest in our history and even in old buildings and architecture. He expressed interest in the older local buildings, past, which I directed them, and particular interest in the Hessian barracks, now part of the deaf and dumb school campus. Wow. The next to the top man now lives in, in the part that is not used for storage and loves it from a story in the local paper. This building dates back to the Revolutionary War and Hessian troops were housed in it. Thus the name. Hargraves was also appreciative of the moving of the John Hansen house from the other side of West Patrick Street, brick by brick, and being rebuilt as part of the new county courthouse. Hargraves is better educated and better read than Hemming, and he again surprised me by his knowledge of the obscure novel I've been asked to read by a conservative friend entitled Canticle for Leibowitz. Uh, it interested them when I told them that the friend who loaned it to me is the brother-in-law of Miami's Mayor Suarez, one of the Cubans who have become prominent in Florida's political life. With regards to the man liquor Carcano rifle, uh, officialdom says Oswald used, it just happens that the Baltimore policeman who teaches an assassination course at a community college and just that morning returned mine that he borrowed. Hemming then made graphic and detailed explanations to Hargraves of its many defects. He said in the early anti-Castro days, they had been offered a quantity of these rifles and refused to accept them. They were that bad, that dangerous, and he complained and demonstrated some of the hazards. One I recall, that could put the shooter's eye out. They laughed and laughed about anyone even thinking that such a we weapon would be used in such a job. Yeah, that's shit, right? I mean, damn. He says that he had met Roscoe White. This is Hemming now. That he missed, met, met Roscoe White in 1962. And that Roscoe White had a quantity of Malikar Carcano rifles. I asked him what caliber because I knew Ricky had specified 7.65 instead of 6.5. And he did say 765. Hargraves is not the braggart Hemming is, and he didn't once raise his voice. I found myself wondering how he'd become involved in those kind of activities so long ago, and it continued with them since. Both seem to be working as investigators now. I did not ask them for any details on this other than the ostensible purpose of the visit. In the course of our conversation, Hemming did confirm aspects of what Hall had told me of his transporting of weapons and other things from the West Coast to Florida back in the 1963 months that are in the FBI reports. Lester Logue, a wealthy Dallas right winger, did confirm that Hall had left a trailer load of his stuff in his garage, as Hall had told me. I think I'm just not sure that was the time Hall was arrested with it after the JFK administration had begun to clamp down on those activities. Um, so, yeah. That's about the extent of my interesting visit to Harold Weisberg by these guys. From 1968, December, ex-CIA employee, he admits bombing the SDS. Roy Hargraves, who in September of 63 trained for an invasion of Cuba on No Name Key under the direction of the Central Intelligence Agency until Kennedy disbanded the training camp, has admitted to bombing the offices of Student for a Democratic Society in Long Beach. When arrested, Hargraves told the police, I did it, and I did it alone. Hargraves was originally charged with the felony of taking explosives in or near a public place. The DA, however, later reduced the charges to the misdemeanor of malicious mischief. The DA gave no explanation as to why the charges were reduced. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. 
And then we have another addendum dated 1115 in 1990. He said, add to visit by Hemming and Hargraves. This is from Weisberg. Um, after I made copies of the comments I recorded after Hemming and Hargraves left and put some in envelopes for mailing, I noticed first that what had been an extensive file on Lauren Hall is entirely missing. It had contained notes on my interviews of him and his telephone calls to me and of clippings, plus quite a few photographs, some of which he'd borrowed and then refused to return. I checked the overflow and dead files removed from my office to the basement, and it is not there either. Then when I, well, then when I located the Hargraves file where it should have been, there was but a single item in it, a clipping reporting that he had pled guilty to the charge of bombing a Southern California office of students from a democratic society in 63, which I just read you. The clipping also reports that although his confessed crime was serious a felony, he was permitted to enter a plea to a misdemeanor and got a slight sentence. He does not look like a man who would do such a thing, do what could kill young people and endanger others. As I noted, he quoted Robert Frost accurately. As I did not note, he was impressed by the sunset as we drove to the Western Union and he commented on it. But aside from the violence intended against Cubans inside Cuba, he practiced it in his own land and against his own people. Interesting. So, after his little visit, the entire Lauren Hall file was missing. And everything was missing out of Roy Hargrave's file, except for one single, solitary, tiny little news clipping. Very, very interesting. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Next up, we have uh, some information about Mitch Rebell. And this comes from the Rock Island auction site. Uh, called the Weapons of Mitch Rebell. Which I'm assuming the Rock Island, they do auctions of firearms and historic firearms. You know, big money talking here. And uh, from their blog, it states the Kennedy assassination. On a stranger side of events, Mitchell Werbel was reportedly present at the Dealey Plaza on Friday, November 22nd, 63, when President Kennedy was assassinated. While not much is known or has been confirmed surrounding his alleged participation that day, Werbel has nonetheless become a subject of intense conjecture. Roy Hargraves, a former CIA operative, told researchers in a 2001 interview that not only was he himself involved in a secret plot to assassinate Kennedy, but that Werbel had supplied him and his team with silencers used to carry out the assault. Hargraves and a small team of four others were ordered to Dallas with clearance from the CIA headquarters in Miami, J.M. Wave, by high-ranking officials. These allegations are supported by accusations that David Sanchez Morales the chief of operations of CIA headquarters at that time bragged about the assassination to a group of friends saying, well, we took care of that son of a bitch, didn't we? Led by an anti-Castro activist named Felipe Vidal Santiago, the group repeatedly carried out the conspiracy using suppressed weapons acquired from Warbell while making sure to fire one unsuppressed shot from the Texas School Book Depository, building uh, to falsely implicate Lee Harvey Oswald as the sole shooter. Hoping to portray Oswald as a part of a larger plot orchestrated by Castro, the assassination would be used to spark support for an invasion of Cuba in retaliation. And then we have a quote at the bottom here from Roy Hargraves, who says, and I quote, Was Warbell the source of the silencers? Of course. He's the only clean source. Every other source for silencers would have strings attached to it. If you tried to get it from one of the intelligence agencies, they'd want to know the whole thing. If Warbell got nailed, he wouldn't give you up. And he knew if you got busted with his stuff, you wouldn't give him up. There were so many of the sound suppressors in circulation that he had deniability at his end. There's no way to prove that you acquired them through him. So that is from the Quiman interview as well. I think we read that already. Um...
We also have another quote from Jerry Patrick Hemming at some point, who states this, if you want to get to the bottom of the JFK assassination, look at Warbell. <laughs> um, others question Warbell's uh, relationship with Gordon Novell, a known CIA operative and surveillance technologies manufacturer who lived with Warbell at the time. Novell is suspected by many researchers to be the true umbrella man of Dealey Plaza. Bell is also rumored to have ties uh, with John Nardi, a Teamster Union official and organized crime leader, along with Jerry Patrick Hemming and Bernardo de Torres, who claim to have been made offers in the past to participate in similar plots. Hemming is directly quoted by researchers investigating the event as saying that Warbell was integral to the entire event. An interesting note. Um, uh, perhaps the most bizarre story to emerge from the legacy of Mitch Warbell would be his involvement with Hustler magazine, its publisher Larry Flint, and an offer to kill four men, including Hugh Hefner and Frank Sinatra in 1983. There's no need to retread that last sentence again, but yes, Mitch Warbell was offered $1 million by the publisher of Hustler magazine, Larry Flint, to assassinate some occupational rivals such as Playboy founder Hugh Hefner and penthouse photographer Bob Guccione. We have a quote here from Los Angeles County Sheriff Sherman Block. It says, quote, Larry Flint one evening called an individual by the name of Warbell to his home and allegedly offered him $1 million if he would arrange for the deaths of these four individuals. <laughs> Uncrazy. While the official motives behind the request remain unclear, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to connect the dots as to how Flint might benefit from the elimination of his industry rivals. What remains strange about the case are the other figures involved, such as legendary singer Frank Sinatra and Triangle Publications owner Walter Annenberg. Apparently, Flint was not very discreet about plotting his schemes either, as Gucci only stated that one of Flint's own bodyguards had informed him of the plot a year prior. Hefner, seemingly unshaken by appearing on a hit list, brushed the events off as a consequence of being rich and famous, and Frank Sinatra gave a no comment, baby. No comment. <laughs> But anyway, that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed. Make sure you're heading to YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, like, hit the like button. And uh, at the Lone Gummin on 7 on Twitter. And the Facebook page is the Lone Gummin Podcast. Make sure you follow along. Once again, folks, thank you, thank you so much a great rest of your day and thank you for sticking me all the way deep inside your ear until next time big bad bob